welcome to the Berlin Green Investment Summit online on the topic of how we can make Berlin climate neutral by 2030. We have the great pleasure of having with us a computer scientist, a historian, an economist, an engineer, and an investor. And it sounds like a bad joke, but it's not a bad joke. It is a very serious undertaking. This is, in fact, in some sense, the replay of a physical meeting which we've had uh, in person a, a few, uh, almost a month ago now, with the benefit of this being recorded and shared with anybody. We're recording this. So um, the way it's going to go, we're going to have a quick introduction by myself. Then we'll have an upgrade from Professor Rockström to Connie Auer, who is a climate scientist. Then we'll have Jamie Abib from Rethink X, who will share his view on that, uh, if it's doable or not to get to 2030 climate neutral. Uh, then we'll move to um, Fabian Eichelbaum, who will share with us the benefits of low level geothermal and um, heat pumps to try to get our cities heated and cooled very effectively and take away the 40% emissions in Berlin's case from the heating sector. And last but not least, we'll have Chris von Stein, who has been uh, insulating up and down of Germany, and uh, he has learned from German politicians something about what is a new technology and what not. Um, the background to this session today is uh, my own my own name is Jochen Wermuth. I am a climate impact investor and currently also active in supporting the uh, plebiscite for a climate neutral by 2030. And in this context, I've had the pleasure of working with a great number of experts, many of these on, the, on this call. We look forward to discussion with you on this. The main question at stake this Sunday, the 26th of March, is whether Berlin will be legally required to be climate neutral by 2030, where this includes a certain amount of offsets, i.e. we may not get to 100% emissions free in all sectors, but we may be able to offset using natural um, sinks or offsets in other countries. The main message or the main debate in the public uh, today is whether this is extremely costly and whether we can actually um, do this without causing people's livelihood to be impacted negatively, uh, whether we will be taking people's cars away, whether this is generally a bad idea or not. Um, and this morning's press conference um, at the end of the campaign that has been going on, I made the point that to my mind, it is not a matter of course, but it is an amazing opportunity where we can get excellent returns from different types of investments in different areas, be it wind, solar, geothermal in Berlin and around it in Brandenburg, be it insulation or these heat networks we'll hear about later. And uh, without further ado, I would then like to turn to um, Connie, who will Cornelia Auer, Dr. Cornelia Auer, who is our computer scientist, but now a climate scientist. Uh, and she will start us off by giving us the background. Why on earth should we bother about 2030? We have the IEA reports. We have the German chancellor saying that being climate neutral by 2050 is what is required to get to 1.5 degrees. Uh, and so I hand over to you, Connie. Look forward to hearing from you. Why bother? Thank you so much. And also thanks for having me here in this round and uh, to give you like the perspective that we have from science. And um, yeah, I'm pretty sure many of you followed um, the recent news that the IPCC uh, synthesis report came out last uh, week or this week. And it very clearly says that now is the time to um, put into place rapid and sustained global transformations in order to reduce emissions that we have. We know all a few years ago, people tended to say climate change is far away. It's like from the time horizon, but also geographically, climate change is happening somewhere else. Then the last years, we really saw that Europe has become like the ground zero of impacts. We really had strong signals that we need to take climate change serious. And now you might also hear some people say, oh, now it's too late. But actually, no, the time is now. And why? Why do we need to stay below 1.5 degrees? We are sure from a scientific uh, point of view that it is vital to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees of Celsius. If not, 
the likelihood of transgressing what we call tipping points becomes much higher. And these tipping points are points that lead to irreversible changes, but also by themselves can trigger cascades of impacts that can potentially not be handled by us humans. So every tenth of a degree of warming that we can avoid makes a big difference. And the likelihood of abrupt and irreversible changes increases with any higher global warming levels. And just to give you one example, what we saw here in Germany um, in the area of Artal. At the moment, we are at 1.1 degrees of warming. And one day in summer, one extreme event, like the flash flood in this Artal, caused a damage of 40 billion euros. At the current level of emission reductions, we are on a path towards 2.7 degrees of warming. So can you imagine what extreme events would cost us at that level of warming? And this money that we have to spend is lost. We cannot use it anymore for sustainable solutions to mitigate climate change. This is important why we need to stay below 1.5 degrees and why we have to act now. And um, I am also a person of trust for the initiative that is doing this Berlin referendum. And I really would say this is a once in a lifetime chance that we have coming Sunday to put a more ambitious law for climate into place that changes intentions to obligations and that puts the right target, i.e. to be climate neutral by 2030. I mean, it is really important that cities like Berlin become climate, climate neutral early because we have a strong lever cities are responsible for 70% of all emissions just because there are so many people living in cities. And we have a shared infrastructure like heating, but also transport. And if we manage to decarbonize this, this will be a huge lever. There will be a lot of intense discussions that we need on the way to climate neutrality, but there will also be a new level of cooperation that will lead us there. And um, I think we should really take this chance and build a climate safe and sustainable future starting from Berlin. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Connie. Can you just remind us of the probabilities 2030 versus 2050 of meeting the tipping points? Well, it's a 50% versus a 67%. And like it's a one to one chance. So um, we really have to act now. Thank you. Okay, we shall. I'm very happy to, with this, turn over to Jamie Abib of Rethink X, who has been truly inspiring and managed to unmute himself. Perfect. So, Jamie, over to you. Here's our historian turned investor, impact investor turned uh, rethinking everything. Thank you very much, Jamie, for being with us and look forward to your analysis, whether it's doable or not and uh, worth it or not. So, Jochen, thank you very much for having me here, first of all. Um, so RethinkX is a, is a, a not-for-profit uh, research organization or, or, or a think tank. And what we're doing is essentially what Connie is doing in many ways for the climate. We're, we're trying to understand how change happens. We're trying to understand the economy as a complex system. Because the mainstream view tends to see change as a kind of linear incremental progression. Unfortunately, change never happens like that. It's always non-linear. It's always rapid. You trigger these tipping points and you get a cascade of change driving feedback loops that kind of ripples across other similar, similar systems. Um, and so what we're doing when we try and understand change, I can really boil it down to three things. The three things that you really need to understand, first of all, is the nature of change, that it's non-linear, that it's rapid, that it's an S-curve. So every time we see a technological disruption to any sector of the economy, it goes in that shape. It starts slowly and then it increases exponentially uh, until it reaches market saturation where it levels off again. And that's the S-curve. The second thing we need to understand is the nature of change because the system that emerges, the other side of the transformation is fundamentally different to the prior system that existed. Right? And most of our misunderstandings about why it's so difficult to transform the economy come from a fact that we see the new system as just the old system with different technology. 
It's not, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And the third thing to understand is that change has cascading effects. So you disrupt or you transform the energy system and you have knock-on effects across transportation, across shipping, across uh, industry, across all kinds of other um, sectors, transforming those industries and creating new opportunities. So we published a paper uh, last year in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine that looked at uh, the transformation of the German energy system. So the country as a whole, rather than Berlin itself. And what that paper found was that Germany could transform its electric power system by 2030, driven really by the economics, by the fact that these new technologies, solar, wind, and batteries were going to be massively cheaper, are cheap, and are getting massively cheaper over time. And that would drive the economics to deliver this change by 2030 to the electric power system, and that the whole energy system could be transformed by 2035. Um, so, you know, our, our view in, in terms of the referendum is that with a, an extra effort at some extra impetus and the right frameworks imposed by the government, that we can accelerate this and do it faster. And actually 2030 is achievable. And it's also affordable is the second point, because a new energy system we calculated for the whole of Germany for generation to replace existing electric power generation cost about three hundred and sixty billion dollars over a 10 year period, that's 36, $40 billion a year. It's a, a, a very affordable level of investment. And for that, you get a very low cost energy system because of course, this system is different to the old system. Once you've built this system, you have almost zero marginal cost, right? And that's really important to understand. You're essentially prepaying the next 30 years of energy production. And the other way this system differs is in how you build it because a, a conventional power system driven by fossil fuels is a centralized system you require great scale in terms of these these big plants to generate electricity the new system is much more distributed but has different properties because you're reliant on solar and wind maybe and so what you do when you build that system is you size it for the darkest days of winter right that's when energy supply is at its lowest with wind and solar and when you do that Every other day of the year, you get a super abundance of energy, right? You get far more energy than you need. Now that's a huge opportunity for the economy, right? It, it creates all kinds of new business opportunities. We would liken it to the internet, where we, we saw essentially zero marginal cost communications came in. And we saw not just a disruption of the communications industry or those industries that relied on communications, but we created a host of new opportunities that didn't exist prior to that transformation. We see the same thing happening in energy, where we move towards a zero marginal cost paradigm that's gonna create a host of new opportunities. And those countries and regions that lead will be best placed to capitalize on those opportunities. So not only is this affordable, it's gonna create a huge amount of competitive advantage. The whole economy will benefit from low cost energy and you'll be the first to be exposed to the new paradigm where these, these enormous new opportunities that are hard to predict up front, but will emerge. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and we can come back with any questions. There's a lot to take in for the moment. I'll pass back to you, Jochen. Thank you, Jamie. It's gotten very, very, it's getting to the to the Rockstorm and Connie level of boom, hard to the point, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so as this is called the Berlin Green Investment Summit, so we would love to turn to one of the solutions that I found most amazing, which in spite of with my friend Klaas, who's on the call here, having looked at clean tech things for, for, for 22 years and more, I hadn't heard about Fabian Eichelbaum's solution. So I look very much look forward to this possible solution to move Berlin to a climate neutral heating and cooling system and get some idea what that what the return on investment would be. So with this, we turn to our engineer, Fabian Eichelbaum. Yeah, thanks too for having me here. Um, I want to introduce um, the so-called fifth generation district heating and cooling network. Um, and as you all know, if we, when we talk about energy transition, it's not only about electricity, but even more about heat and cooled. And heat and cold is um, there are solutions I want to introduce you. There are two main challenges in urban areas, for example, in Berlin, but in every dense urban areas. So the first thing is that um, there's a shift between energy demand and the surplus. For example, 
uh, in winter we need heat and in summer there's a lot of heat in the city but we haven't it in winter so we need a storage a seasonal storage to use this heat from summer in winter and we have this storage the storage is the underground and um, using geothermal energy systems we can use this seasonal storage for our purposes and the second thing is that in dense urban areas there's um, often there's no space that everybody has its own geothermal source so the main point is to to link to interconnect building demands and surplus so for example in the winter there are a lot of houses who use fossil fuels for water heating and for heating and at the same time the groundwater is overheated it's um, yeah an effect you have in all big cities the groundwater is quite too warm so extracting heat from the groundwater and running heat pumps can normalize the level of temperature and um, improve the ecological conditions of the underground and produce heat we use in the houses and interconnecting the houses via such a yeah it's called low exergy um, network um, can help us to bring um, geothermal sources that everybody is enabling to uh, use heat pumps because um, right now not everybody can run a heat pump because there's no source for the heat pump but connecting the houses um, uh, one to another can enable the possibility that everybody can use the heat pumps in dense urban cities or areas and in the summer that's the underground can serve as a cooling source because what we do right now is at the one hand there are houses who burn fossil fuels emit co2 emissions for water heating and the house directly next to it uh, cools with chillers for example office buildings who puts the heat and put it to the atmosphere so our um, urban atmosphere it's called urban heat island um, effect so that urban atmosphere is quite warm in the summer and what we are doing right now is even heat it up more so what we should do is take this heat put it into the ground or use it direct directly as waste heat for the house next to it um they yeah, are making hot water or domestic hot water so interconnection between these houses can help to save energy because you use the waste heat the waste heat for a good purpose at the neighbor house so this um, is like i don't know a general energy system on the one hand as a seasonal storage for winter time but also um, getting synergy effects synergistic effects because you can use the waste heat directly for your neighbor and therefore you don't need to burn fossil fuels and you have um, thermal groundwater management to improve um, the conditions of the groundwater and the underground itself so mm -hmm. um, the main point also is that you don't have to um, I don't know restructure the whole city at once but you can start like uh, with cells and there can be a like cellular development so the cells can grow together and then you can um, develop it not only at once but when yeah there the nucleus is start growing and growing growing so with the time you can and transit and trend to um, tra transit the whole city Excellent. And, and, and yeah. what is the investment you think needed for Berlin? And what do you think is the return on investment? Because many people speak about cost, but it could be that actually there's a decent return here, right? So we, of course, have a situation where the energy prices almost doubled. So probably the returns are even higher. But what is the estimate of how much money would need to be invested in Berlin and how much, what would be the return on investment? I think it would be uh, depending on what system, but it's like two billion. Uh, euros but the return would be uh, like depending on the energy cost but um may, maybe uh, six to ten years maybe 12 years depending on the uh, electricity costs of course yes so that's an eight to twelve percent ir which is fantastic that's about five times as much as the german government pays you so and and we can also own it all together that's excellent okay 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, then uh, Fabian, I would move on to uh, the next topic, which is called the Dämmung in German or insulation. Uh, that is a major political issue. Many people think uh, it's too expensive and many people are afraid they will uh, even even traditional green voters have approached us and say, well, we're very worried that I won't be happy in my old age anymore because the insulation of my house will be so expensive, I will never be able to pay it. Uh, and therefore, we were happy that Arnold Drever, who is one of our experts uh, for the Leitstudie of Good Future dot Berlin, uh, has introduced us to uh, Christopher von Stein, who will share his experience of actually doing it in real life. And this is an economist who joins the party here. Chris, are you ready? Probably muted. Um, muted, you're muted, yeah. Uh -huh. Now we can hear uh, you. Okay, I thought um, uh, somebody else had muted me and uh, somebody else would have to unmute me. So, no, you, but you, I did you, it myself. You, you master, welcome. So we'd love to hear from you what we can do and how much would it cost? Is it worthwhile? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I'm very great, grateful for the opportunity to take part in this summit. And um, I introduced myself. Shall I introduce myself again? Was that in the unofficial part? Okay. I'm a board member of the Association of Insulation Fiber Blowing Companies, which is called Fachverband Einblasdämmung and FVED in German. And I'm also an owner and a manager of a likewise company myself, which I founded in 2008. So, um, and since I'm in this, I'm new in this circle, just do interrupt me if you feel I'm speaking beside the point. Um, surely we agree uh, on the task um, that the task of how to make Berlin climate neutral in 2030 can be tackled only with an interdisciplinary approach and a mix of, ver of a variety of measures and technologies. So I'm not um, promoting the one technology that's going to save the world. Um, but also, I suppose that we're all convinced that we can um, only find the solution if we look for it instead of looking for excuses why it shouldn't work. Um, and to help win over our critics, we must imperatively look for the best way to get there at the lowest of cost. And I'm very glad that this um, topic has already been um, tipped on before uh, today. And now, surely, insulating buildings is one vital part of it which for my taste has always come a bit short. Um, it's vital not only to um, reduce uh, the total energy input uh, that is needed uh, to put into a building because the building is wasting it, but it's also um, insulation is a vital part to allow heating systems to run at a lower circulation temperature. And these lower circulation temperatures in turn allow other technologies and other energy sources uh, like these uh, local heat networks, um, which would not work efficiently at a higher circulation temperature. So it's uh, in, in some parts, it's new technologies that come into effect. In some parts, it's existing te technologies that just work much better at a low um, lower circulation temperature. I've um, often had customers um, who had been told by their um, heating uh, installation company that they needed new radiators, new heaters um, under their windows, which is um, not true because um, they are overdimensioned regarding uh, the higher circulation temperature. But if you insulate the house and you have lower circulation temperatures, then these heaters or radiators can stay put where they are. So insulating existing buildings has a reputation of being expensive, um, of tenants having to endure lengthy construction sites with noise dust and scaffoldings. But this is only one part of the whole story. To my mind, the distinctly smaller part, if everybody knew what everybody could know. Whatever, wherever buildings have cavities, and cavities they have manifold in roofs, double wall masonry, wooden beam ceilings, and between neighboring buildings, Wherever they have these cavities, insulation materials can be blown into these cavities. 
Now, insulation can be done at prices between 20 and 50 euros per square meter of enveloping surface. And that's about 10 to 20% of the cost of conventional technologies like thermal insulation composite systems. So the technology that I'm talking about is sort of the low hanging fruit that pays back between four to eight years. It's not doing the same job as say a modern um, complete um, thermal insulation composite system. It's, but it still does about two thirds of uh, that composite system at 10 to 20% of the cost. So you don't have to do much mathematics to know that that's, this is the first measure, like low hanging fruit. You pick those apples that you can reach just from the ground or with a simple ladder because before you go and um, uh, use a machine crane or something. Um, it can be implemented immediately. It's done quickly. It is um, uh, meter shonen. How do you say that? It's it's not with a, with a very low um, cost uh, to the tenants. Hassle. Uh, sorry. The tenants, uh, no little little hassle for the tenants. Little yeah. hassle for tenants or owners. Uh, How quick can you do this? You arrive uh, it one day. Takes uh, about two, one to one day to five days. One day to a week usually. Our um, uh, well, what, size, what, what, size, what, what, what size of a building per construction site? Well, mm -hmm. uh, about family homes. Mm -hmm. And if you have multifamily homes, say a, fix, a six family home, and you do the top ceiling, which is a warm, cold barrier, uh, takes maybe two days. It all, always depends on how um, comprehensively you can insulate the building uh, if it has cavities there. And what is the normal, uh, the, the thick? Uh, the thickness is dependent on the thickness of the cavity. So, um, but I, I, mean, I mean, what is the time needed for the, the one that's five times more expensive and uh, the thicker insulation, the full insulation? Ah, okay. The, the full insulation takes weeks, takes weeks, takes the scaffolding, noise and dust, and we just take a few days. And um, the price you invest, uh, for instance, for a single family home uh, equals about a family holiday. Um, and um, if you do the thermal insulation system, uh, it, you, you spend thousands of euros. It uh, uh, corresponds maybe to the price of a car. Um, so it seems much cheaper and, uh, and much more effective. It's and is cheaper, it, is, is, faster, is it, more effective. And uh, it, it's not um, preventing the upgrade that comes later. What we very often hear is um, that they've been, um, uh, that they found ways or they, they are doing model uh, refurbishments of old houses. And they say, okay, we've done it. Now it's it's got a, um, uh, it needs no more. It's a no energy uh, consumption house. And, It takes hundreds of thousands of euros. Um, but this is um, insulation, uh, in-depth insulation, what they are uh, promoting. But what I'm promoting is, in, is a broad insulation, bringing houses from a bad level to a fairly okay level and not an excellent level uh, is a way To, do, to save many, many more tons of CO2 emissions for the same amount of money or for less amount of money. Excellent. And how, how relevant is it to Berlin? How many houses with cavities will you find in Berlin, you think? Or, or, uh, practically or, or... every house. If you uh, look at the top ceiling, now every city or every region in Germany is different. There are some regions in Germany where you have more double, uh, double shell masonry. In Berlin, it's uh, not so common, but in Berlin, you have many, many um, uh, wooden joist ceilings. Uh, and between those joists, you have cavities. And these cavities you can fill with a, um, about uh, at least eight centimeters of uh, insulation, bringing it up from one uh, watt, per square meter energy consumption, bring it down to about 0.3. Wow. Okay. So 
that's for very little money. And also we have many, um, I have to switch that off. I think it's okay, we, we can, we also, we're almost through, yeah? Let so me just can... say one thing, we have yes. many off-label, on and off-label uses that cannot be done with conventional technologies. So it's not just a uh, technology which is cheaper, but inferior, but in some parts, which I'm not going to elaborate now, uh, it is even superior. Excellent. And can you share maybe your in input from the politicians who look at your high-tech uh, new breakthrough and ask you whether it is uh, <laughs> it is proven or not? Yeah, that this in, indeed many politicians um, whom I've tried to explain this uh, they said, okay, well, thank you for a very interesting and innovative technology. But this technology has been invented in the 1920s. Uh, mainly in Canada and Scandinavia, and I, um, I, sometimes I'm not polite, and I answer to these politicians, well, if you think this is innovative, it just shows how old-fashioned your concept of inf insulation is. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, even though he's a British education, he hasn't quite turned to the gentleman yet as Jamie, I guess. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, that was our, our, our rock star presentation. Thank you very much. And we would now, I would propose initially a quick discussion within among the panelists if you have any questions to each other that would be much appreciated and then we'll open up in a couple of minutes to the uh, the whole uh, group of participants I'm very happy to discuss with them and um yeah so um connie do do you know something about the other cities that uh, that are doing things and who else is doing this is berlin the first or is it the last or well, there is this uh, EU uh, mission where cities could apply, and um, to my the best of my knowledge, I think it's it's definitely 100 cities. I think it's even 109 or something. Um, also, not small cities, larger cities, and they are also attempting to get to climate neutrality until 2030. So Berlin is rather catching up than taking the lead. That's right. Yeah. Um... And, and James, I mean, also please feel free to ask each other questions. Uh, but James, do you want you, do you, uh, Jamie, you, um, the other benefits, could you highlight the other benefits? First of all, we get the climate thing done. What other benefits would Berlin and what would Germany have? And what would, you know, do you think Berlin has a, as you were the outsider in some sense, do you think it's a relevant city or is it the same as Hicksville, Tennessee, if it does it? No, I mean, I, I think we all accept globally that Berlin is an important city, right? It's the heart of Germany, it's, you know, which is the heart of Europe, which is, you know, looked to around the world, particularly around, um, you know, energy and, and, and efficiency and, and climate solutions. So, so Germany has a, sorry, Berlin has a very, you know, a very powerful and important position as a, as a test bed, right? And that's what we need. We need cities to lead. Uh, and, and, and those cities that do, you know, we think will do very well. Um, I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that there are other benefits. This is not just about solving climate change, right? You decarbonize the economy, you, cre you create a host of benefits. You know, number one in many ways actually is, is energy security, right? You have all the photons and electrons you need to produce all the power you could possibly want available locally everywhere in Germany, right? You're not reliant on any kind of foreign import. You have a much more kind of distributed modular system which is far more resilient, right? So you you know the chances of of of, of you know anything throwing out the, the 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 power system, the energy system, you know, extremely remote, right? And, and very localized if it happens. Um, and and then of course there's cost, right? I mean these technologies are on an extraordinary cost curve, right? Solar, wind, and batteries, you know, solar's down probably 80, nearly 90% over the last decade or so. Batteries are down by about 90%. You know, wind's down by about 50%. And, we, you know, we won't see, we'll see, you know, fairly similar improvements over the course of the next decade. So, you know, you're going to have an extremely low cost energy system if you do this. And of course, because there's no flow through the system, right? As I said earlier, you know, you've got a system where you build it and then it functions, right? There's almost a zero marginal cost. There's some, you know, obviously distribution costs and, and management costs, but very, very low um, cost of running that system. You know, there are other ways of financing this, this, um, this system that, 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 that I mean, it's, it, it's off topic for this debate that can, can transform the kind of the ownership model, I think, and the social contract at some level. So, um, you know, that, that, and that benefit of low cost energy goes across the economy, right? Every sector 
uses energy, right? And 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 every sector, you know, will will, will, will reap the benefit, the competitive advantage that comes with low cost energy. Um, and I, and I, I think the you know the um, you know the internet example is 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 instructive here, because often at the outset of a transformation like this, we don't know what the future possibilities look like. Right? So no one sitting back in the early days of the internet could possibly have seen how transformative it might have been and some of the business opportunities that arose from it across pretty much every industry. Right, it's transformed everything from dating to restaurants. Right, to supply chains. I mean, you know, everything looks different now. And 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 enormous, you know, opportunities, platforms, businesses were built on the back of that. And I think when we move to this this new paradigm, essentially, with this sort of super abundance of energy for most of the year, um, there will be all kinds of opportunities that emerge from that, not just in existing industries that get transformed and take advantage of that zero cost energy incentive. But but new opportunities that emerge, and 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 I think you know when we think about solving um, climate change and solving some of the issues like heating that we've talked about today, you know we have to think about it in the context of that new system, right? That transformed system. So we have to be very careful um, to be to be technology agnostic or technology neutral, because the technologies that work in the current system aren't necessarily those that will be able. Um, the best advantage in the future system. And I think that's important to remember. Excellent. Okay, good. With that, I would throw it to open to any other panelist or any other participant to have any question. Please uh, unmute yourself and feel free to ask if you have any question to our panelists. Um, I have one. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. Maybe it's a mixture of... Um, please, please quickly introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm Thomas, uh, living in Brunswick. Um, joining um, the this kind of um, expert circle in uh, June last year. I am in a, since June last year in a very close and trustful contact with Ingo Stuckmann, um, continuing with um, Holger Jahn and um, now with also with, with Jochen. And um, we recently uh, founded the Good Future Do and Think Tank. and. Um, Ingo, um, let's, let's move to the question. Quick intro. Yes, the question uh, is um, engin an engineer at Siemens and all as well. Yes, and a, a climate activist and so on, but uh, doesn't matter. Um, Ingo Stuckmann, question, question, um, question. He founded the Zero Mission Think Tank in 2015, and he is asked in uh, USA by Denver, the city Denver, no, no, no. Um, uh, what kind of solutions you have to make climate neutral in 2030. And uh, he knows as well that Los Angeles, New York, they want all to do the climate uh, neutral in 2030. Um, what is our, um, keep in mind, um, for the scaling of the solutions for Berlin, for the Europe and all the world? Um, have we a strategy already or it is um, now we do Berlin and then we see or we still already have a strategy uh, to scale it up? Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, I believe that, uh, that there's also a zero emission think tank uh, in Germany and there are other people who think they founded it. So I don't know that I think Frank Ossenbrink and Igo uh, and uh, Eike Weber and Gerrit have been involved in SET as well. So uh, let's not claim one of them has founded them, please. But uh, the question would be if, um, uh, if, if there are plans to copy paste. Uh, does anybody have an idea? Or to copy paste? Is, 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 could Berlin be copy paste? I think the first stage, I think Jamie, you mentioned that um, that uh, Berlin could be a good uh, case to get it done. Um, but can I just, before before we, we go to you again, Jamie, I have one question. I see one question here I wanted to pick up. This is Magda on how to, Magda, do you want to quickly ask that question yourself? How do you get people to do it, I think, is your question, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, it was a question. Uh, sorry. <laughs> question was whether how do we get people to actually start insulating their homes why would they do yes, that for the, especially for the old buildings like i'm not an owner of the flat and uh, there's an owner of the house and he doesn't do anything for years so what would be the next step if it's if yeah okay what would be the uh, yeah maybe Mr. Von Stein. I've already there. unmuted my microphone and eager to answer this question. Well, we sometimes have um, tenants uh, uh, 
where they um, either haven't yet asked the owner or they haven't got through to the owner uh, uh, to do some very evidently um, rewarding insulation. And then we just send uh, uh, an offer to the owner. So if you, uh, tenant is meter, is that right? Yeah, so if you are a tenant um, and you don't get along to, uh, with the owner, just ask us, we send uh, a, an offer to the owner. We don't need the owner to make him an offer and um, make him think. And very often I think in about two thirds of the cases, the owners say, okay, I didn't know it was that cheap, let's do it. Sounds very good. No push. So we turn to, to maybe I to, can add something here. Please go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, in the building uh, legislation there was quick, quick, uh, quick intro, quick intro. Class Helmke, founder, German civil physicist. Thank you. Um, so then there was a, in discussions the regulation that the, the energy efficiency passport of the building or of the of any apartment will be linked to the. Uh, heating costs. So the less energy efficient the building is, the higher the percentage the owner of the building pays for the heating costs. So that is in discussion. And uh, that was certainly something which would modif mot motivate the owner of the building to uh, take a better, uh, buy a better insulation, even though he usually doesn't pay for the for the heating. Excellent. That's a very good point. New policies. We have a great new government partially that does great new things, it seems. Uh, Garrett, you had a question. And please quick intro and go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jochen. So I'm Garrett. I'm an entrepreneur, mainly in the energy industry and also from education, a climatologist. Uh, and though even being climatologist and very into this field, I only recently learned about these easy insulation techniques. So question goes to Chris, maybe also to Fabian. I know that I can save money and have a great rate of return when I insulate my own home, um, but I would like to do it as an investor. This is a perfect investment opportunity, but I don't see how to do it. It's maybe also the reason why this doesn't scale. So are there opportunities for me or somebody else to invest in, as an investor into the insulation of other homes and get a of return to scale it up? Uh well, I um, tried um, for years and years and years to um, uh, do the same thing for my own clients because I had some clients who couldn't afford even our uh, te technique of insulation. And I said, okay, you pay back not in one sum, but you pay back in uh, within the... Um, uh, payback period of between four and eight years. So we calculate your heating economies and um, just you just, just pay us back what you save in heating costs. And that we did that maybe three or four times, maximum 10 times. And we've done about 3000 insulations till now. Uh, so I don't really see a way uh, to be an investor in that sector. But what you could do is found another insulation blowing company and uh, cooperate with me. Uh, by the way, um, Cornelia is uh, raising her hand all the time. Yes, but yes, she yes. wrote into the chat that yes. she, she, she didn't find the button, but she, I can see the hand now. Okay, Fabian, quickly, if you have a, is there an investment opportunity at, that uh, you see on this uh, geothermal, then we turn to Marina and Connie. Connie first and Marina, yeah. Uh, I would see it like um, Chris von Stein. Um, if you are uh, like the owner or um, you have possibility to decide which kind of uh, heat and cool supply uh, um, will be planned or um, constructed in a the house, then you, um, you, know, pro, um, you get profit directly from, from green heat and cool. But um, if we talk about um, cities and, um, and, and, I don't know, uh, these low exergy grids in, in, in public areas, that's uh, out of your reach, I, I would say. So it's like um, it's a public um, uh, yeah, responsibility to construct these networks in this in that areas so yeah mm -hmm. i think generally garrett you're onto something very exciting we should do the same thing that's uh, what's it called elon musk's solar roof factory in, uh, in in america does you know take a picture 
of the place, estimate how much energy you could save, tell the guys, do you would like you would you like to pay 10% less for energy, and then negotiate with the local people and the people just sign up, sign up, sign up, and the company makes lots of money by insulating and by putting these heat networks in place. Over to Connie. Thanks so much. I have two maybe more technical questions, one to Fabian and uh, one to Mr. Von Stein. So Fabian, my question to you would be like, what we've learned is that when we take, for example, um, in winter heat from the ground and we take like, we want to supply many buildings. So we take a lot of heat from the ground. Is there some kind of competition occurring? And if so, um, what would be your suggestion that even in very cold days, we can supply enough heat from the ground for the multitude of buildings? Are you thinking of something like power to heat or something? And uh, another question, if I'm allowed, would uh, then be about the insulation. Like I have learned that the best insulator, a bit counterintuitive, is air. And um, could you please explain me like how your insulation works, how you kind of get a cushioning effect or something? I would find that really interesting. Thanks so much. Okay, so who's, who's going to start? Fabian, maybe. Maybe I stop. Um, <clears throat> you extract the heat from the underground, you put in in the summer. So it's uh, like limited on the amount of energy you put in. And the heat pump, uh, which is um, um, planned with such a system, fits to the building. So it's always kind of um, fitting the, the heat pump to the building demand. And in the coldest, coldest winter day, um, you normally have a second um, um, heat generator in buildings. Also, for example, the district heat network, the normal district heat network, also burns gas in that really cold uh, days. So uh, you should. Um, or it's it's a question uh, of of um, the power of your heat pump, but this this always uh, always has to to go along with the area you um, use as the underground storage. And that's why these networks are such important because if the area of your house is not enough for supporting the building, you can shift energy from outer areas to inner city parts um, to supply heat and cold in the summer for supply every uh, houses in such areas. So that's the main point of such networks. And because the energy level, 5 to 15 degrees Celsius, is so low, you can directly cool and you don't need to insulate these pipes. So that's cost efficient. Super, thank you. Uh, Arnold Dreva said he could also try to answer your question. So on the on uh, basically what Connie said is why on earth are you uh, replacing air with stuff when air is the best insulator? That seems completely silly, if I may say it in a less diplomatic fashion. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, you are right. The best insulation material is air, but the air must be divided in billions of cells of cells billions of cells. So um, if you go to the Antarctic or you climb in the to the Mount Everest or so, you are wearing um, um, polyester or I don't know, downen, what's that? Downs. Uh, downs. Downs, downs. So not the polyester and not the downs are insulating, but the air, but the air must, um, it is forbidden the air to, um, to move. Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. And that, and this is a this is a function of every insulation, even is if it is downs or polyester or cellulose or polystyrol or every. Excellent. Chris, do Let you have anything to add? add something, mm -hmm. if I may. Uh, if you have a double shell masonry, and you have an air gap of maybe six centimeters in between then the air starts to roll. It ra rises up in the inner shell, which is heated, and it falls down on the out outer shell, bringing the heat from the, inner, from the inside to the outside, bringing the cold from the outside to the inside. So that's exactly the opposite of insulation. That's why you have to divide it up. If the air would stay put where it is, 
it would insulate, but it doesn't because it can move and it expands when it gets heated and it uh, contracts when it cools down. Excellent. Thank you. Marina, um, you were next, I think. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, Johan. I have a question to Jamie uh, about this um, sort of new energy system with five times uh, overcapacity. Yeah. So uh, I wonder who would put money, yeah, capex uh, investment into such a project. Uh, so with such an overcapacity, you would basically get uh, energy for free, I think, most of the year. So um, those people who would build up new plants, uh, or I... You're breaking up, but I think, Jamie, you're muted. Uh, the question is, yes. why on earth should I invest if I get nothing for it? Yeah, so, so over the course of the year, you'll get the return you require, right? And, 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 and so, you know, that I guess the secret from a consumer perspective is to, you know, to, to expose consumers to dynamic pricing, right? So we adapt our, our usage patterns. But, uh, you know, over the, over, uh, over the course of the summer, there'll be a super abundance. And we think that um, demand for energy will shift in response to that overcapacity where there's very low cost energy but over the course of the year you'll receive you know whatever the sum is i think we calculated for germany about five cents per kilowatt hour for that system uh and 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 you can you can invest viably in that um you know with it with with you know the government might think about to accelerate it things like offtake agreements or investment um into that system or subsidy, but but an unsubsidized system, we think for Germany, comes in at about six or sorry five or six cents per kilowatt hour in terms of generation. Amazing. Okay, we are uh, or we've, we promised ourselves to be a very tight, uh, uh, short, well, nine minutes over time. But I would invite maybe every panelist to uh, say one more sentence on. Uh, um, what do you think? Why? And it, well, can Berlin do it? Why should it do it? And what do you recommend the Berliners? Maybe <laughs> that would be your wishes for Berlin for Sunday. Maybe who would like to start? Uh, in the order would be Connie, right? <laughs> okay, then I take the lead. So I think uh, Berlin should definitely go for this target. Every tenth of a degree counts. We know this. Going to climate neutrality has many co-benefits. I think we also agree on this. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward towards a broad cooperation and discussion and getting this goal going. Thanks. Thank you, Connie. Over to you, Jamie. I, I would echo Connie. I mean, you know, it can be done and it could have huge benefits elsewhere across the economy. I I think the challenge is to look at this right. I think the way most of us think is to look at the existing system and try and work out how to make it less bad. You know, my 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 argument would be that 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 that's the wrong way to approach it. That we need to begin to understand how we enable what is a fundamentally different system to emerge with all the benefits that come with it. Because when you're in that mindset of looking at the old system you see sacrifice you see high cost you see all kinds of other things that come with but they just don't exist when you get to this new system that functions differently there's low cost by essence has an abundance of energy and 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 we need to think you know very differently to enable this to happen and we need joined up policies we need you know top down intervention to get the ball rolling i think Jochen, last time we spoke we used an analogy that the mainstream view sort of sees the problem as this massive boulder at the bottom of a really big hill. And the challenge is to muster all the force, all the tools, fiscal policy legislation is on to push that boulder up the hill. Our view is no, it's, it's the other way around. The boulder's on top of the hill. And the job of government is just to get it rolling. And then gravity will take care of it. Right. And, 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 and then the job of government becomes to keep it on track and make sure it doesn't do any other sort of collateral damage on the way down, but it's a very different challenge. That's great. So Berlin, get out of the way. <laughs> Fabian, <laughs> what is your closing sentence? I think it's a good opportunity to put some good 
pressure on on the politics on the way so that we can show that something is possible that we can uh, maybe open new possibilities open new doors and I just put in the chat um, the uh, overview about already realized project of this kind of network. So if other cities can do it, I think Berlin, yeah, uh, of course can do it. So we should use this possibility. Yes, we can. Good. Chris, you will advise us from the north. Well, instead of um, saying uh, uh, all has been said, but not by everybody, uh, I want to thank Connie for her question because that's from the that's a question from the category all you ever know wanted to know about insulation but you never dared to ask, and <laughs> it's all very 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 logic in insulation. All these um, concerns about mold and um, uh, poisonous insulation materials and the, all this sort of, we all have we have answers to all of these questions, but many people don't dare to ask these questions and Connie has done a step forward. Thank you very much, Connie. All right. Well, thank you everybody for this wonderful uh, quick, quick get together. We uh, will hopefully get these wonderful messages and news shared by uh, the recording and hopefully we'll have a big impact to try to as many people as possible out on Sunday. The uh, main challenge is everybody should please take five people to go vote because we may not have enough quorum while the majority is likely to vote in favor we need at least 600 and 8000 i think yes votes to make it happen 18 okay so thank you very much the berlin green investment summit is really about investments we'll try to have this once a quarter online in this short format and uh, bring together all sorts of investors policymakers engineers historians uh, computer scientists <laughs> economists thank you very much and have a great evening thank you bye bye